I'd like to talk to you tonight a bit about B viruses and why you need to know about them. Um, I'm going to talk with a uh, bias towards the B viruses you're likely to encounter in the UK. Um, but there are a lot of B viruses about. So here we have, let me, I'm not changing the slide. Let's see, has that worked? Here we go. Um, so um, there's about, there's at least 25 honeybee viruses in circulation and they have varying um, distributions and um, pathogenic effects. I've highlighted in red the ones in the UK you need to worry about and I'm going to go through them in a bit more detail. So in 2011 and 2012, the National Bee Unit undertook an unprecedented survey of apiaries across England and Wales. And they sampled bees from 4,500 apiaries. And the total sample size was over 19,000 colonies. Uh, so what they did was they, they, they took these handfuls of bees essentially and, and sent them up to the lab to be analyzed for presence of pathogens. So they were looking for EFB and AFB, Nosema species, and they also did a screen for some of the more common viruses, the viruses they were, they were expecting to be present. Um, and this was 10 years ago now, bear in mind. What they found at the time was that they could detect a form wing virus in 67% of cases. Um, and that's not much of a surprise, you'd probably expect that to be higher now. Black queen cell virus in 34% of cases, which surprised me because I've, I've never come across it in my experience. Sac brood virus in 31%. And at the time, chronic B was at less than 1% prevalence in all of those samples. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about chronic B later because even though it wasn't common back then, it's becoming more common now. So uh, Giles Fudge did a study and found that it was something like 14% prevalence in 2017. So I'm gonna talk a bit about chronic B later on, because it's quite an important virus. Uh, it's worth mentioning other viruses screened for just didn't seem to be present. So slow paralysis virus at 1%, Kashmir B virus less than 1%, and Israeli acute paralysis virus, which is actually a problem in, in some countries, just doesn't appear to be, or did not appear to be at least a problem there uh, here 10 years ago. It's also worth bearing in mind, that this is not a snapshot of symptomatic disease. This is measurement of the pathogenic um, particle. So it's, it's detection of the virus. So what, what this survey says is we detected this virus. It's not necessarily saying that 34% of colonies had symptomatic virus of black queen cell virus, for example, or symptomatic sac brood at 31%. What they were saying, it was detected there. And often you will find a virus is detected but it's not necessarily causing these symptoms. So I'm going to go through these common viruses in the UK because they're the ones you're most likely to encounter. Talk a bit about transmission, symptom recognition, which I know for some of you who are way more uh, experienced beekeepers than me will probably be things you already know, but I feel obliged to go through the symptoms anyway. And a little bit about containment and prevention of these viruses, of which um, unfortunately we, we've got sort of a, a limited arsenal against viruses. So, so when I've gone through these viruses, I'm going to talk to you a bit about my research and, and hopes that I can um, help out with viruses in the long term. So I'm going to start um, with sac brood virus. So sac brood virus is one of the most likely that you've come in contact with besides deformed wing virus. You often find it popping up in colonies when they're a bit stressed. I, I find it when I found it last year when I had a bit of a my varroa got a little bit out of control, I'm ashamed to admit. Um, and what happens with sac brood virus is that it accumulates in the hyperpharyngeal glands of the nurse bees. And you can see this little diagram here, the hyperpharyngeal glands are in the, the head. Um, and this is involved in making the brood food. So the nurse bees, they pick up the infection, it goes to these glands and the brood food becomes infected with the virus, which then gets fed to the developing larvae. And these larvae will grow up and be all right, look fine. They're accumulating the virus as they develop, and then they'll die just after capping. And so, like I said, the infected bees, the adult bees can be infected too, and they can have shortened lifespans, but you won't necessarily be able to see by looking at them that they have sac brood. So this is a very much a, a brood pathogen. Um, traditional sac brood symptoms, I'm sure you, you've come across, but we'll go through them again. So the reason it's called sac brood is because the larvae form this tough leathery skin and so you can pull out these um, these larvae that have the very characteristic raised heads pretty much intact and you, you have this bag of, of yellowy goo who might turn brown as they 
decompose. You'll also observe an um, uneven brood pattern and you might get sunken discolored cappings because bear in mind that these, these sac brood pup uh, larvae and pupae that you're seeing in the picture, they've been picked away, the capping has gone. So often the nurse bees will pick away at the brood, the, the, the cells, cell cappings, and have a look underneath. They want to get rid of these um, infected larvae. They can detect that they're infected. They want to get rid of them. But sometimes you'll, you'll have cappings that are intact and you, you won't necessarily know that there's a sac brood died uh, dead part pupae in there. So you have to sort of pick it away and have a look. So as decomposition progresses, they can become really black and brown. So this sunken discolored cappings is worth noting it characteristic of another brood disease called AFB, which uh, hopefully is something you're familiar with because it's a statutory notifiable disease. If you're in doubt and you see some sunken discolored cappings and it looks dodgy, just get your tweezers. It's the most valuable bit of beekeeping equipment if there's something funky in there. And if you look at this image on the bottom left, you've got this partially uncapped sac brood um, infected pupa under there. And you can see it's got its characteristic um, raised head poking out um, of the cell, whereas an AFB infected uh, pupa will, will have this um, triangular shape inside. So if in doubt, get your tweezers and, and have a good route around in there. So containment of sac brood. Sac brood isn't usually a cause for huge concern. Uh, it's unlikely to, to result in the death of a colony. So the infection is low level, often presents when the colony is stressed by some factor and most healthy colonies will get it under control. But if symptoms persist, you've got this sort of um, go-to beekeeping advice of considering requeening the colony. And you should always think about with all disease, positioning your colonies to minimize drifting. And this, this just sort of sounds like a, a note of things in a list to do, but actually minimizing drifting can have a huge effect on transfer, transmission of disease and parasites like Varroa. Um, in one study, they tagged some bees and found that if you arranged your colonies in a long line and all the colonies look exactly the same, the same height, the same entrance facing the same direction, you can have up to 20% of the bees in a colony not belonging to that colony. So you can imagine if you've got a disease colony in your apiary, that can spread pretty quickly if you haven't arranged the colonies in different orientations, maybe having different colors and so on, which I appreciate is difficult to do if you have a lot of colonies. So always keep in mind that the viruses can be persistent. So sac brood can survive in comb and larvae, honey and pollen for up to four weeks. So it's really crucial not to transfer material between hives, it might be tempting to rescue some wax or honey from, from a, a hive, but um, best, best avoided if you want to keep these things under control. And if you have interacted with a virus infected colony, definitely a good idea to wash your tools and your suits before moving on to your clean colonies and apiaries. So I'm only gonna to touch on black queen cell virus um, very quickly because quite frankly, I couldn't find much information about black queen cell virus, even though we were showing it as detected in 34% of apiaries in the random apiary survey, and that, that's a lot of colonies. So the transmission of black queen cell is the same sac brood. You can think of black queen cell virus as the sac brood of queen larvae. So in the same way, it's transmitted in the colony by asymptomatic workers, and the queen larva and pupae will develop into these, these toughened skins, these, these sacs of fluid. And the reason it's called black queen cell is because also the cells, the cell walls get patches of, of black in them as well. And this is something that's more likely to be suffered by people who are doing large scale queen rearing. It's less, less common in small scale um, beekeeping, backyard beekeeping and so on. Um, containment of black queen cell virus, again, same with sac brood, treat it as the sac brood of queens, minimize your drifting and have good hygienic practices. It is correlated interestingly with Nosema apis, which is a gut parasite. So if you're worried about black queen cell or Nosema apis, it's good to be aware of the symptoms of both. So Nosema symptoms are characterized by dysentery, crawling bees and slow buildup in spring. I had an encounter with Nosema myself this year and it's quite unpleasant. Um, I'd like to be able to offer you some treatments for sac brood or black queen cell virus, but unfortunately they don't exist. And the best tool you have is um, 
a good hygienic practice and setting up your colonies to try and prevent um, transmission of disease. So I'm going to move on to chronic B paralysis virus now. So this is where things get a bit more serious because chronic B can cause devastating losses. Um, I would say probably chronic B and deforming virus are the two most devastating viruses we have and they're the ones to worry about. And chronic B unfortunately seems to be increasing, not just in the UK, as we can see from this graph by Giles Bunch, which is showing the increase in levels in the UK since 2006, but also in the U USA, they found an increase 4% in 2012, up to 18% in 2017. So somewhat similar to what we've had in the UK. China, they've seen increases from nine to 38% and Italy from five to 10%. And there are various scientific um, uh, sources showing this data. So we don't know why it's increasing so suddenly. Um, I'll tell you a bit about its transmission. It's not transmitted in the same way as sacwood and black queen cell virus. It's transmitted sort of mechanically or topically. So if you imagine the bees rubbing together, it's almost as though the virus is exuding on their on their cuticle, on their skin, and they're able to acquire it from each other that way, which is quite um, quite unusual. So you can imagine that during confinement and during bad weather, or if the bees are really crammed in together, this is the perfect opportunity for chronic bee to really get to very high levels. It can also be transmitted between the bees through the fecal oral route. And in an infected colony, you can see the level of virus just shoots up. So symptomatic bees, the bees that you see that are sick can have up to a trillion, that's 10 followed by 12 zeros, numbers of virus particles, but that's a huge amount of virus. Um, and you find the highest level of the virus in the guard bees, which is interesting and is probably something to do with the interaction with more of their sister bees than the other bees. It's, it's lower levels in the nurse bees and it's at the lowest levels in the brood. So even though you will find chronic bee in the brood, there's only between a few hundred and a few thousand particles in, in eggs and larvae. So it, it seems to be less of a, a transmission between the queen and her eggs or, or feeding to larvae and, and definitely more of a bee on bee contact issue. So chronic bee symptoms, I hope you haven't been unfortunate to see this. I, I've seen it recently, a colleague has had chronic bee and he had all of these classic symptoms. So the trembling wings and bodies, they, they have black or greasy looking skin, uh, dislocated K wings. As you can see, the bee on the top right has the classic dislocated K wing, which means you'll have some flightless bees. They might look a bit bloated and almost certainly you'll have them crawling in the grass outside the hive. And at worst, you will have handfuls of dead bees right outside the hive entrance. It's very upsetting. And you can have very strong, healthy colonies just succumb very quickly to chronic bee. Once they've got it, um, it's, it's a pretty serious situation. There's a good chance the colony, the colony will collapse. It doesn't always collapse, but it can devastate the hives, which you can imagine if, if an individual bee has a trillion copies of a virus um, that, and that's getting passed on by bee to bee contact. So containment of chronic bee. So chronic bee spreads through contact. So you have to reduce overcrowding. If you think you're liable to have chronic bee, and it's more likely if you're a bee farmer and you have a lot of bees in an area, additional brood chambers and supers to try and reduce the overcrowding in the colony, but also trying to reduce the bee population in an area. So if you've, it's unfortunate that it's just um, a factor in density of populations, you're going to have higher incidence of disease and it's true with chronic bees. So if you've got a very, very high density of colonies in an area, that certainly isn't going to help the situation. So try and reduce populations within an apiary and within a a colony and also reduce your chances of transmission through robbing, which is also a possibility. Um, and pollen traps have been shown in a recent study to really increase your risk of chronic bee. Um, I'm not sure that they're as popular here as they are in France, and it was a French study, but that's something to be avoided if you're worried about susceptibility to chronic bee. So chronic bee is a really persistent virus and it can recur. So the colleague I was talking about, he'd had chronic bee last year in his apiary in a different colony. It had gone away and come back in this other colony. So 
just think about regular comb replacement and not moving frames and materials between your colonies or between your apiaries because this is a really persistent virus um, and it can persist on your tools, um, potentially on your suit. Uh, so, so think about movement of material containing, potentially containing the virus. And there's been discussion about potential treatment for chronic bee being something called a reverse shook swarm, which is where you take your frames of adult bees and shake them off far away from your colony and your healthy bees will fly back to the hive. And in theory, your diseased bees should stay on the grass and die, which in theory should reduce the amount of virus in your colony. But I don't think it's 100% effective. I think some of the infected bees can fly back. That's certainly what I was observing yesterday with my colleague. I was trying to catch some of these chronic bee bees for myself, for my research and they were flying off. They were surprisingly um, busy and able to fly despite being clearly very, very sick. So I, I'm not really sure. There's no data, there's no scientific data yet on whether that reverse ship swarm works, but chronic bee is so devastating, it's definitely worth trying and seeing how it goes. So unfortunately, again, no treatment for chronic bee. Um, so we're going to move on to our last virus on the list, which fortunately there is some kind of a treatment for, and that's deformed wing virus. So deformed wing virus really interests me. This is the most um, interesting virus on the list because it was historically present as a, a really harmless virus. Deformed wing virus has always been around. And you can you can still find it in colonies of bees that don't have varroa, and it's, it's just not that harmful. And what happened was varroa arrived in the early 90s and turned DWV into a devastating disease. So what happens when the colony has varroa is that the mite introduces this new method of vectoring the virus. It's passing it between bees through the, me the, the mechanism of um, parasitizing on, on the brood. So the virus levels are able to get up to really, really, really high levels that just wouldn't be seen through the normal transmission of the virus, which is from mother to egg or um, fecal oral route and things like that, which don't really allow the virus to get to very high levels. Um, but we've got this diagram here on the right showing um, a figure from Stephen Martin's paper from 2012. And that's a canonical paper for demonstrating that Varroa and DWV are linked. And what Steve did was he's shown that before Varroa arrived in Hawaii, there was a low prevalence of DWV as uh, shown in these white pie charts here because just showing that only these red ones had any DWV and the diversity of the DWV in those, in those colonies was very high, which is a good thing. There's lots of different variants of DWV and most importantly, the load, the number of viruses in each bee was very low as well. So we've got something like between a thousand and 10,000 and that, that's fairly low. Doesn't cause any symptoms, fine. But then Varroa arrives and what you find is very quickly DWV prevalence increases, strain diversity decreases, and the load number of virus copies per bee, it shoots up from around a thousand after the first year, then up to oh, over a million. And then after three years, you've got a billion copies per bee. So something about the viral virus isn't just allowing it to get to higher levels. It, it even seems to be selecting for these virulent strains. And that's really interesting. So just a quick talk about the symptoms. We all know what the symptoms of deformed wing virus are, with deformed wings. You also get these shortened bloatened abdomens and dead pupae. And all of this um, is kind of a disaster for the colony because the bees that emerge with deformed wings are dead within a few days. And it's an energetic dead end. If you think about all of the energy that's gone into making these bees and they've just died, it's a total waste. Um, and if allowed to get to very high levels, which it will do if you've got high varroa levels. So now we have to think about DWV and varroa sort of as one, because when your varroa levels are high, your DWV levels are going to be high and you're going to end up with something called parasitic mite syndrome, where you got all of these nasty effects of um, spotty neglected brood, your chewed cappings, they start chewing down the larvae and pupae. You've probably seen these headless pupae that you get, you can see in the bottom right corner. Um, those are circling some, some headless pupae. There'll be a lack of early brood. The colony might be aggressive. My colony last year was 
and there may be some supersedure cells. And once you've got to this state, it's actually kind of a critical situation. If you don't get the viral levels down, then you, you've got a good chance of losing that colony. But fortunately, unlike the other viruses, is we know that there is a way to reduce the levels of DWV because we know that more mites means there's more vectoring of DWV and higher levels of DWV. And plenty of studies have shown when they apply the mite treatment, they end up with a reduction in DWV. So in one study, they found a thousandfold reduction in the level of deformed wing virus particles when they applied, I think it was amitraz in that particular study that I've cited there. And that's particularly important at, in August and September. So this diagram has been taken from the MBU's Viral Management Booklet. And what I want to emphasize here is that the most important time to make sure your viral levels are in hand is when these winter bees are developing in August and September. So you've got your highest levels of brood in July and August, which means your varroa levels are peaking because all your varroa are hidden in there. That's where the majority are. They're not in the floor, they're not crawling around in the bees, they're in the brood. So you have to think about, have you got the varroa levels down to a level, a level where your winter bees that are developing aren't going to be suffering from the effects, A, of the, the varroa themselves, um, parasitizing them, but B, of having high levels of DWB, because if that's the case, they won't be able to manage to survive the winter and bring the colony through into the spring. So I don't want to get get yeah, too much on my high horse about varroa treatments, but I think there's a lot of confusion about varroa treatments. And I've, I've sort of collated a list of the effectiveness of varroa treatments. I know people are very um, put off by certain varroa treatments, particularly synthetic pesticides, even though they can be very, very effective. And, and that's actually a very good position because overuse of these synthetic pesticides does lead to resistance in the mites, but we're very fortunate in that we have some chemicals that are much less likely to lead to resistance, such as oxalic acid, which if you use that in winter can be extremely effective and reduce your mite levels up to 98% if you use vaporizing. Formic acid, which is the only one you can use during the honey, honey flow. So definitely something to think about if you've got your supers on in July and August and you, you want to knock your mite levels down. And then thymol, which is pretty, pretty popular, a little bit less effective, but, but still a fairly good product. And we've got some biotechnical methods, which, although they're less effective, can be a very good way of knocking your viral mite levels down um, without applying chemicals to your hive. So I'm going to stop talking about varroa treatments, not talk about varroa treatment. Um, so basically, we don't really know why some individuals or some colonies are more susceptible to certain viruses. You can have bees within the same colony having vastly different levels of virus. Um, so it, it seems to be a function of exposure to the pathogen, how much of the pathogen is there, how much is in the honey or have they got from the tools, but also stress in the colony. And I don't think stress is an overused word, but what I mean by stress is, um, are they getting the optimum diet? Are they parasitized by other things? Do they have enough space? Is there another infection in there? Is the weather bad, like recently? Application of chemicals, these are things we, we want to think about because the best thing at the moment we can do in terms of viruses is to keep colonies as healthy as possible, keep an eye on whether they need supplementary feeding. I was still putting blocks of fondant inside my colonies last month, which is ridiculous. Um, are they in a sunny, dry location? Do they have access to good foraging? Have you set them up to minimize drifting? And always be mindful of good hygiene. I know it's a pain um, having to stop what you're doing because you found something, but, but it can make a difference. And keep your tweezers on hand. Just get in and have a look under those cappings if anything looks a bit dodgy. So oh, I've gone, <laughs> I've talked a bit too long. I'm just going to talk very briefly about my current project. So my current project is um, a completely new way of um, combating viruses. So um, when I was in Fair, we looked at using antivirals and um, that, that's sort of using chemicals to treat viruses the same way you might for livestock. But this is very different because I have done work with a bacterial endosymbiont called Wolbachia. And this bacteria has been investigated a lot because it was found that when they introduced this bacterium into mosquitoes, it reduced the ability of those mosquitoes to vector really, really serious viruses like dengue, yellow fever, chikungunya and Zika. And I've taken a diagram here from a paper showing wild type here shows how much virus is in uh, 
a dengue virus mosquito, Aedes aegypti, when it's just normal and uninfected and you've got something like 10 million to 100 million particles of dengue virus in this wild type mosquito. On the right, we've got, so it says WML, WML is a Wolbachia. These mosquitoes have been infected with a, a bacteria. It's, it's a friendly bacteria, it's not pathogenic. And the levels of dengue virus in those, even though they've been infected with dengue, is zero. And this has actually, it is actually being used by um, the World Mosquito Program. Uh, they're releasing mosquitoes with Wolbachia and finding they're able to reduce disease in human beings because this Wolbachia is, um, is obliterating the chance for all of these viruses to be transmitted because it's essentially treating the mosquito rather than the human. So it looks like Wolbachia might be um, permissive to infection into honeybees. So Wolbachia occurs naturally in loads of species of not just insects, but other art arthropods, worms, and so on. Um, and there's some reports that Wolbachia has been naturally infected in um, some South African honeybees. So the purpose of my project is to see if I can infect Wolbachia into honeybee cells and honeybee workers. And if I can, does it have the ability to inhibit deforming virus or sac virus or black queen cell virus? Um, and that, is a big question. It could be potentially very exciting or it might not work, but the viruses in bees are somewhat similar to the viruses in mosquitoes that have been inhibited. So I'm, I'm fairly hopeful for this project. It's going to be quite an exciting few years as we try to find out. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is briefly a PhD studentship that's beginning in 2021 with joint sponsorship between BDI, yourselves and UBK who um, are supporting my new student who's called Miles Nesbitt and we're going to be taking him on board to expand our study of viruses. He's going to use something called a honeybee cell line to do some comparative analysis of the different strains of DWV. I didn't get into that today but there are different strains of DWV and they appear to behave differently and nobody can really agree what the actual differences are between these strains and what that means for bees. He's also going to investigate the impact of co-infections of viruses because we're finding DWV everywhere now. And it seems feasible that this is having an impact when other viruses are also present, potentially having a, a more devastating impact. You've got two viruses present um, where D DWV exists, which is almost everywhere. And we're also going to use the cell lines to see if we can get a better understanding of the cellular life of DWV the effects on the host genes and cell health without the confounding effect of Varroa, because when you study a honeybee in the UK, it's got Varroa in it, whereas our cell line doesn't. So we can have a look at DWV and its interaction on the honeybee without having this confounding effect. So Miles is going to be starting that in October, and that should be quite an exciting project as well. So uh, I'd like to thank the ESRC who have funded my Wolbachia project. Bee Diseases Insurance and British Beekeepers Association, who are jointly funding the PhD studentship with Purbright, and Luke Alfie, who is my, um, my boss at the Purbright Institute, who has supported me in getting all of the funding for this. And I do apologize that I've gone over time, but if there is time, I would welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Um, if anybody does does want to ask a question, uh, yeah, go on. Probably just unmute and, if, if, and take it from there. Hmm. Deathly silence, Kirsty. Uh, I've, I've learned a new word, Wolbachia. I'm going to go and impress somebody with Wolbachia now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, uh, there's um, if you Google the world. Uh, the World Mosquito Program, I think it's called, you'll find all sorts of information about what they've done with Wolbachia so far. It's really interesting and exciting stuff. All right. Um, is there anything that is pre-published in what you've just said uh, or displayed on your screens, on your slides? Uh, someone's just asked if they can have a PDF, and I know that depends on whether you're including pre-published information, and that's always a dilemma here. Um, do you have a view um, on that? I don't have anything pre-published on here yet, so I'd be happy for, for you to share these slides. Okay, fine. Thank you. That answers Ray's question. Um, somebody, uh, Joseph Page, says, Kirsty, can you 
introduce the bacteria into colonies in the UK or is this in vitro modeling? So um, that's a good question, actually. So at the moment, it's going to be in vitro modeling, as you put it. Um, so I'm going to be introducing it just into the cell line and into worker bees. And that's that's a transient infection because the worker bee will, in the lab, will be in the lab and we won't be breeding from it. But in theory, if this works, then the next step in the project would be to see if we can infect a queen. Because the other thing about Wolbachia is, and, and that was relating to one of the pictures that I didn't explain. Um, so this, this picture here. So Wolbachia mainly resides in the reproductive tissues of insects. That's where it's at its highest concentration. And it's naturally passed down from mothers to their offspring, sometimes to as many as 100% of their offspring. In, in, in the mosquitoes, for example, the Wolbachia will be passed on to all of the offspring, so all of those offspring will be resistant to the viruses. So if we can get the Wolbachia into the cells in these um, models in the lab, and it inhibits virus, the next step definitely would be to get it into some queens and measure if Wolbachia will be transmitted the same way in bees as it is in other insects and passed on to the offspring. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody's asked, uh, chronic bee paralysis is virus. Uh, very many cases this with the bad weather, two so bad were cold, mm -hmm. two surviving. Is requeening worth it? The affected colonies were related, but at different sites. Is it worth requeening chronic bee paralysis virus? My feeling would be no. It seems to be the stock advice, but I can't say with any certainty that it, it doesn't work. But I feel like it's it's such a recurring problem that you may be sort of better off starting from scratch. I mean, it's worth trying to rescue a colony, but, but when you're talking about buying in new queens, it, it can get quite expensive. Um, so I personally don't think I would. So my colleague and I were talking yesterday about whether he should requeen his. And um, it's it's just a case of, are, are you sending good money after bad? Um, because you, you risk reinfection. So I, I know it's the standard advice, but I think it's, it's a personal call, really. Okay. There's no definitive data to say that that's definitely going to work. Okay. Uh, are there any uh, antiviral treatments in research at the moment for DWV? Um, well, when we did our project back in Fair, we did find some antivirals that helped prevent um, DWV and reduce chronic B, but only when used prophylactically. And it didn't. It so it didn't work post infection. So. For, it's not clear if that would really be feasible in the field. But the other thing was that these were some pretty potent antivirals. Um, and I think we were all felt quite reluctant about proposing that as something as a, as a treatment in, in the field. It's quite useful in the lab if you're working on a system, if you're working on a bee or on a cell line to have an antiviral where you can get rid of the virus. Um, so you've got a, a control group. But I think for field use at the moment, the antivirals I know of that work are not really appropriate for field application and would probably be prohibitively expensive anyway. Okay. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Any other questions? Um, yeah, Ma um, Martin, Roger. Roger Patterson. Hello. Yeah, sorry. I, um, I'll try to get a chat through, but I can't. Um, <laughs> um, now, go ahead. Yeah, can I, can I go ahead, please? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, well, yeah, Kirsty, uh, you mentioned that um, overcrowding was a problem with chronic bee paralysis virus. Yeah. This, is, this is anecdotal only, um, but over the years I've noticed that um, colonies on Hoffman frames seem to have more chronic bee paralysis virus than those on what I call British spacing. Now, the difference is five millimeter, uh, three millimeters. Um, you get 35 millimeter spacing with uh, Hoffman's and 38 with... Um, what I call British spacing, either castellations or metal or plastic ends. Now, my thinking is that with Hoffman's, you only get a 10 millimeter gap between the faces of the combs, so the B space. But with the um, British spacing, it's 13. So effectively, mm. you get about 30% more gap between the faces of the combs. And I'm just wondering if that. Um, uh, if that gives the bees a bit more space, so they're not rubbing together 
So it's only an anecdotal thing. Would it be a possibility? Definitely. It, it definitely stands to reason that the more space they've got, whatever dimension you're talking about, whether it's B space or just having more floors upstairs, that it would reduce um, the contact between individual bees um, and potentially be enough to, co to, to reduce the symptoms. Because you've got to think about, you know, it, if a virus is there, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's what level it's at. That's the bad thing. So if you can reduce the contact and you get it down to asymptomatic levels, then you're on better ground than otherwise. So yeah, I think that's a really good, um, a good point actually. Uh, Julian Routh, uh, good afternoon, Julian. Um, does cleaning hive tools, etc., with washing soda have any effect on the transmission of viruses? Um, it should do, yes. So that that is what I use to decontaminate my equipment. I use washing soda. Um, it's the stuff in the green packet, isn't it? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I use. Yeah. Okay, so somebody has that's, a, that's an observation statement, really, very much like COVID. It's down to viral load. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think on that note, uh, we will draw this to a conclusion. Thank you very much, Kirsty, for your talk. That was very illuminating, and we'll we'll back here. I'm, I'm <laughs> gonna remember it. Okay, everybody else, thank, thank you. you. That's the end of our meeting. Uh, enjoy your beekeeping.